Welcome everyone to our uh, 14th Marvel Distinguished Lecture that keeps getting more and more distinguished. So it's a great pleasure to have here today Professor Kieran Burke uh, from the uh, uh, University of California, Irvine. Uh, Kieran did his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara with uh, Walter Kona. Uh, that most of you might have heard has been the inventor of the differential theory and Nobel Prize in 1998 in chemistry. Uh, so after his uh, PhD, he did a sort of postdoctoral stays uh, with David Landreth and John Perdue, that also I believe uh, many of you know. And then he arrived in 1997 in Rutgers, so that's, uh, that's when we actually met. Oh, yes, yes. And we'll go later into the details of that. And uh, he stayed at Rutgers until, uh, I've forgotten the year, 2006. 2006, and that's where he moved to Irvine, uh, where he is now the, the Chancellor Professor of uh, Physics uh, and Chemistry. Uh, Kieran is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, he has now been elected to the International Academy of Quantum Chemists. That's a very distinguished thing. And is also the awardee of the Burke Award from the Royal <laughs> Society of Chemistry, no relations, uh, and so on. And uh, you probably all know his work, but uh, you know, especially on the fundamentals of uh, the SD functional theory, the conceptual developments, uh, uh, exact functionals, and uh, uh, what we see today is actually uh, you know, this uh, interaction with computer science to work on a machine learning of density functional for application in molecules and materials. Thank you. Like that. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be back for the, I don't know, upteenth time in Lausanne. I really like visiting here and I have many, many good friends. Uh, and yes, I'll talk about uh, uh, specifically the work I've been involved in uh, in which we apply machine learning to try to find density functionals, which is a, just a small niche thing in the bigger picture of machine learning in, in molecules and materials. And I've, de I've designed a lecture, uh, so I'll first give a general introduction about DFT, although that will be rather short, and then we will get into all the machine learning stuff. Uh, just a quick uh, idea here, how many people have run a DFT calculation? Raise your hand. So, uh, how many run, have run a PBE calculation? Raise your hand, okay. You each owe me a beer. Oh, no. <laughs> and in Switzerland, that's worth quite a lot. Uh, well, no, that costs quite a lot. Uh, okay, so, uh, so the background in DFT, then, then about machine learning DFT, and then some of the more recent work. Uh, and the last one uh, is a work that got, fin got submitted in, on Mond Monday of last week, I think. Uh, but it's on my website. So everything I'll mention of our work is, is available from my website, I think. I think. Okay, so, so there's this universal problem in all the sort of science of everyday matter, which is uh, the electronic structure problem. So we make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, the nuclei are heavy, the electrons are light. We want to find the ground state energy of the electrons as a function of the nuclear positions. Uh, and when we write out this problem from our basic quantum mechanics book, first we write down the Hamiltonian. It has three pieces, the kinetic energy of these n electrons, the electron-electron repulsion, and the one-body potential that they all feel. And that one-body potential has a very simple form uh, for, say, an isolated molecule or a solid. Uh, and what causes all the complications is the electron-electron interaction because it couples all the electrons to each other, so this is a very nasty quantum fermion many-body problem. Uh, and from the basic books, we learn that we can solve the Schrodinger equation directly, or we might use the min uh, variational principle, minimize overall allowed wave functions, uh, anti-symmetric and normalized, this, uh, the Hamiltonian, and that would give us uh, the ground state energy too. And because we're at sort of room temperature, since the electronic energies are very large, the electrons are basically in their lowest energy state. Okay, and uh, this isn't the original proof of Holmberg and Cohn, uh, but this is what we call the constrained search proof. You can prove that there is a density functional way of looking at this 
you just break the minimization into two steps. You minimize overall wave functions yielding a certain density and then minimize overall densities. And the important point is that this last term, the one body term, can be written directly in terms of just the density alone. So therefore, if you write this in, in terms of the density, you get a minimization principle over just densities. So this is a much, uh, um, looks much simpler than minimizing over the entire wave function. You don't have to find wave functions, you just have to find densities, but of course, You've put all the complications of the many-body problem into this thing, which is often called the universal functional. Uh, more importantly, in 1965, Cohn and Cham wrote down these equations for fictitious non-interacting electrons that are defined to yield the same ground, to have the same ground state density as your original problem. So over here, this is minus two over R is, is this is for a helium atom, two electrons feeling minus two over R. And if, if Cyrus Umbergar, my friend, solved this problem with quantum Monte Carlo, got the exact density, ground state density, and then this re red line is called the exact cone sham potential. So I put two fake non-interacting electrons in this potential, and I get, uh, and that's the exact cone sham scheme. It gives me the exact ground state density. And also, uh, they wrote down this expression for the potential, in which they show that it's equal to the one-body potential, the Hartree piece, and this exchange correlation piece, which you can deduce from a small fraction of the total energy, called the exchange correlation energy. So, this is, so you break down this functional into these three pieces, the kinetic energy of the cone sham electrons, the Hartree piece, and the exchange correlation piece. So what this does is means that you have to approximate only a very small fraction of the energy, uh, and if you have an expression for this, you can differentiate it, and you get a closed set of equations for every possible electronic system. And almost all modern DFT calculations solve these equations. A price you have paid compared to pure DFT is that you have to solve these, the, these Cohn-Sham equations. They're much cheaper than solving the direct Schrodinger problem, but they're still a bottleneck uh, in the calculations. Uh, and commonly used functionals are the local density approximation, where you approximate this exchange uh, by a simple integral over n to the four-thirds, and the correlation is more complicated, but integral, but only depends on the density at the point where you are. Generalized gradient approximations and hybrids came, sort of came of age in the 90s, and uh, GGA uses both the density and its gradient to improve the accuracy of the approximation and a hybrid mixes in some fraction of uh, Hartree-Fock and gives you better thermochemistry again. Uh, now, the, there's a huge range, as we'll see, of DFT applications in all sorts of areas of science, but I randomly selected a few for today. Uh, we'll see. So, so, yeah, the computers and codes and algorithms are always improving. Uh, People now really make new predictions. One of the earliest ones was Jens Norskov's uh, prediction of a better catalyst for the Haber-Bosch process, which is, I think, the largest man-made chemical process on, uh, on the planet, uh, and, and came up with a better catalyst. It was slightly, slightly more expensive catalyst, though, unfortunately. Uh, all the stuff in the materials genome project uh, that people are doing today tends to use DFT calculations. Uh, and the world's hottest superconductor came from a Chinese group who did a search uh, over uh, simple materials under high pressure, as suggested by Neil Ashcroft, and found that under pressure, hydrogen sulfide is the world's hottest superconductor. And that was made a couple of years ago in Germany. Uh, so the breadth of these applications, uh, as I said, picked at random, right? Uh, we hear about exfoliation from high throughput computational uh, methods, so it turns out a lot of the best stuff is going on here. I don't know if this has appeared yet. Uh, then another randomly chosen one uh, is a prediction of room temperature, uh, a topological insulator. This is going to appear, I believe, in FizRev letters uh, in a week or two. Uh, uh, now this, this, this is interesting, right? This is in the Journal of Chem Informatics, right? Now, I always thought you spelt the opera A-I-D-A, -A, but apparently the authors of this letter, uh, this letter don't know how to spell AIDA, right? Uh, 
Uh, electrochemistry, here's some people doing electrochemistry uh, using DFT calculations. Okay, so the sad part is, right, all those calculations are incorrect uh, because they use an approximate exchange correlation functional and it's, uh, you know, the, we have to use approximations when we do these calculations, right? So the idea is that you have different rungs of approximations uh, and I was talking to some people about John Perdue's scan functional uh, this, uh, this morning, which is the most recent rung that he's produced. John Perdue produces most of our best functionals uh, and that scan uh, is there and people are applying it and it's working better in many cases than GGAs. Uh, but the idea is that at each rung of this ladder you go up to the heaven of chemical accuracy. Uh, and the big picture is, so many people are doing applications, many people are doing theory and coming up with approximations for the exchange correlation energy. So today I'm only going to talk about ground state DFT. Uh, uh, so chemistry, it starts off in condensed matter physics. Uh, chemistry is bigger, material science and biochemistry is bigger still. But these days actually material science is larger. The growth of use of DFT is bigger in material science than it is in chemistry. Uh, and actually, so this gives you some idea of the scale. Uh, this is kilopapers per year, right? Uh, there are not many branches of fundamental theory that can measure their impact in kilopapers per year. And so we must have gone past this 30,000 mark a few years ago. Uh, so, so, so DFT has been used for a vast variety of things. Uh, now that's sort of the sales job for DFT. In reality, of course, when you go, I guess a lot of people here use quantum espresso. You go to the code, you find all these different letters. The correct way to do a first principles calculation is to ask your experimental friend what is the number you're trying to predict and then keep pressing buttons until, until the right number comes out. That was a joke. Uh, I'm just checking, right? Uh, uh, well, it's only kind of a joke, right? Uh, okay, and this is my picture uh, for, for instead of the ladder. Uh, okay, okay, so that's, that's DFT very quickly in a nutshell, right? Uh, now, so machine learning in the physical sciences, right? So machine learning is invading all our lives all over the place, right? It's always producing really bad movies that it recommends for you, right? Uh, but it works pretty good when you use Google and you use PageRank and stuff like that. Uh, so and it's a very broad term uh, and it's sort of related to big data and data science. Uh, and people are using it in lots of different ways and I heard about some of those different ways this morning and I'll be here for the next few days. Uh, uh, but in order to improve uh, calculations in physical sciences. Uh, and, and in fact, I'm editing a special issue of, uh, base of data enabled chemistry for Journal of Chemical Physics at the moment. Uh, so it's becoming very, very popular. Uh, and look, oh, just another randomly chosen uh, paper. This one is uh, getting forces, right? So a very big thing that people have been using, and it seems to be working rather well, is to come up with interatomic potentials uh, for different problems uh, and use, using often Gaussian processes to design these potentials and you give it a bunch of data, it, it figures out a potential. And again, in the past, right, we would rely on some very clever intuitive people to come up with the, uh, these potentials. And you could get some great potentials, like what was it, the Stillinger-Weber potential was really, really good, but it relied on tremendous insight of the people designing the potentials. These days we're interested in, we can make so many different uh, materials that uh, you can't wait around for people to have that insight. You want to automate that process. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about something that we started six years ago. Uh, it was when I met a guy, a guru of machine learning, and you know there were some some insults were traded. Uh, finally, ending up with a bet involving certain beers, and the question was, could you use the machine learning to design density functionals? And I'm going to sort of show you what we, the pathetically little amount we've achieved uh, over the last six years, right? Uh, 
So kernel ridge regression, people ask me why we use kernel ridge regression because my buddy is a guru of kernel ridge regression, right? Uh, and actually, you know, a lot of this stuff is big data, right? In fact, what we're going to see here is small data. This only really works if you have small amounts of data because it gets too expensive if you have too much. So this is not neural nets. Uh, okay, but, but it's been very successful in lots of, lots of areas. Uh, and people are using it in lots of branches of uh, uh, sort of material science. So the idea is it's really just a sophisticated version of fitting uh, in one way to think about it. So I'll give you a little example. So say we have some function that we want to approximate. So and we have a bunch of data points at which we know the function. So this is supervised uh, learning. Uh, so we write it as a linear sum of kernel values at the data points. And so the kernel has some measure of distance in your space. Uh, and we're always, we've tried other kernels, but here we'll always use Gaussian kernels. So a Gaussian, uh, so this is just the, the distance between the two points. Uh, and then what you do is you, so you fit it with this, this bunch of kernel values, and then you minimize it and you put in a noise parameter uh, so that you don't overfit. We'll see that in a minute. And when you minimize this, you know, uh, uh, functional, you get, it's easy to figure out what the coefficient should be. So, so here we have some noisy data and, you know, we want to fit this function. Uh, so if we, if we set our noise level too high, then we get a very, very f smooth function and uh, it doesn't really match the data. If we set it in the middle, it looks pretty good. If we set it too low, then it will go through, try to go through every single point, uh, and also be, it'll be overfit. Uh, okay, so, so, so when, you, when you set this system up, how do you set these hyperparameters? Well, there are a variety of sort of cross-validation methods. Uh, standard one is to sort of divide the data, say, into five boxes, apply the machinery to, uh, oh, here to four boxes and then test it on the fifth box. Uh, and, and that gives you values for the hyperparameters and you do that for each box, leaving one box out and then you average in some way. And when we do that for this example, it turns out that here's our best fit going through that procedure and the noise level is very close to that. Uh, and the exact function is that black line. So it's, you know, we started with the black line and added noisy, uh, noise to it and got those data points. So it, it is this balance between overfitting and, being, and not capturing the information in the data. So Klaus Robert Mueller is my friend at TU Berlin. Uh, Matthias Rupp was a postdoc uh, with him at the time. And John Snyder was a very good graduate student I had then. Uh, so, so what we decided to do was instead of uh, trying to get the exchange correlation functional, which everybody does in, in DFT land, we decided to go after the, the non-interacting kinetic energy functional. So if you knew that functional as a functional of the density, and we know it exists, then you would actually be able to do a pure DFT calculation and minimize the energy directly without ever solving the cone sham equations. And one, the reason we went after this was because uh, one of the problems would be coming up with uh, accurate data. So of those 30,000 papers a year, every iteration, think about it, every iteration of every cone sham calculation that was done to generate those 30,000 papers, each iteration, gives you an example of a kinetic energy and a density that goes with it. It may not be the solution to your problem, but at that point, you've solved the cone sham equations, and it's an example. So data is not an issue uh, for this, and it could be very important. Uh, that's Leonard Euler, who uh, wrote down these Euler equations. So orbital-free DFT, right? Uh, you want to construct functionals uh, that are sufficiently accurate and the, the target of accuracy will always be something like a one kilocal per mole, uh, or about a twentieth of an EV, because we know that the errors in our exchange correlation functionals are bigger than that. So if we get down there, uh, we're not creating any new errors. Uh, you also need the functional derivative to, in order to 
sort of bypass solving the cone sham equations, we really solve them to get the density. Then we evaluate the energy as a last shot on the density. So to get the density, you need the functional derivative. Uh, and we'll see that it'll be useful when we keep doing the same kind of DFT calculation over and over again. And in fact, an important idea is that the functional can be disposable. You create the functional for the problem that you're solving and you throw it away at the end. Uh, I was driving on the Autobahn with Hardy Gross when I explained to him my idea about this and we nearly crashed off the Autobahn because this is heresy within DFT land because you're supposed to generate general functionals because that's what you're used to uh, uh, doing. Now an important point is in this work we'll be going after totally non-local effects such as when bonds break. So non-local effects occur when you, when you separate two systems. And all, pretty much all of our standard exchange correlation effects fail when you stretch bonds. And people talk about static correlation or maybe strong correlation when that happens. But the functionals go bad. The same ha thing happens if you use the same kind of functionals for the kinetic energy. When you pull two systems apart and electrons localize on two different systems, then they tend to fail. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're going to design machine learned functionals that do better than the human ones. So okay, so our first problem was we just took particles in a box uh, because that's the first problem you do in quantum mechanics, but you put different potentials in the box, you get different densities, and we're going to generate training data that way. Uh, so we did 2,000 potentials, you put 1,000 of them to one side to test on, um, we use a thousand to train. So, so here are different potentials in the bottom of the box. They're just some of three Gaussian dips. And here are different numbers of particles in the box. And within a few weeks, we had uh, extremely encouraging results. We got the kinetic energy for one particle, say, uh, here the mean error in kilocals per mole is already you know, about one kilocal per mole with 60 uh, data points. So we train on 60 and, and you could drive it down as small as you like depending on your, uh, the amount of data that you want to use. Uh, and so, so this is less than one kilocal per mole if you do local density approximation or GGA it's uh, almost 200 times bigger. Okay, but the problem turned out to be with the functional derivative uh, so that red line there is the functional derivative of our highly accurate machine learned functional and the black line underneath is the exact functional derivative. And they spent several months trying to convince me that that red line was a good approximation to the black line, right? If you uh, smooth out those oscillations and things. But then we spent time thinking about it and we figured out, uh, like why is it highly oscillating and stuff? And the answer is, uh, if, you, if you interpolate on data, if you go in some direction in which you have no data, well, there's no reason why your, f your, your learned functional would know how the energy is supposed to change in that direction. So what we would do is you, when you take a test density, we do a principal component analysis, which we'll do uh, over and over, get the, the directions in which you have data and throw away all the others. So you project on the directions in which you have data, and this is a way of staying on the manifold of densities for which you have data and then the thing should work and it's not supposed to work when you stray from that manifold and when we project it on a manifold then uh, it's essentially perfect uh, so it's giving those good functional derivatives in the direction where you have data uh, so so yes yeah, so 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 we found a way to bypass that and we we could get the chemical accuracy just just uh, on the data that we had, uh, and we could find the density self-consistently. So that was the first thing that we did, just uh, proving the principle, right? Uh, then we did bond breaking in little 1D systems uh, and showed that our functional worked there. Uh, now when I say our functional, we retrain it for each problem, right? You, take, you have to get a bunch of training data. We also tested many things about uh, the accuracy of the functional, but the idea was that we would get, go finally to large systems and real applications, and again, I want to stress, right, we haven't got there yet. Uh, uh, we're going to be stopping somewhere around here. Uh, 
So the most recent results are from Felix Brockert, who's just going to graduate this month with Klaus in Berlin, Li Li, who graduated a year ago, uh, now works at Google, uh, he was one of my students, and then Thomas Baker, another student of mine that I share with uh, Steve White, he does D DMRG calculations. Uh, so these two new papers, one is sort of doing 3D, but still doing this cone sham problem, and then the second one uh, is one in which we look at the exchange correlation energy, and I'll just des describe them very quickly. So machine learned approximation, so, so uh, this has appeared. Uh, so, so what happened was as we went to more and more uh, realistic systems, doing the projection uh, started getting more and more expensive. And it got too expensive to do for even for a water molecule. So we changed the idea. And now we, instead of getting the density as a functional derivative of our energy functional, we learn the density, you know, of, it's a vector valued function, uh, functional of the potential. So instead of learning just one number, we learn the density in some basis, right? But that way we don't have to do the functional derivative. And this works out very well. Uh, let's skip that. Uh, so this, uh, this was our old method, uh, is the blue line, and then in different, two different bases. This one is too expensive to use, but this one here, it, just in plane waves. This is for our box problem. We see, so these are called learning curves, uh, and you see that you get an order of magnitude at least improvement using the new method, uh, so much higher accuracy than using our old method of projection for a certain amount of data. So it works out uh, much better. Uh, then when we do, we, first we do H2 atom, this is the error, we do, so all these calculations used PBE for the exchange correlation, but what we're trying to do is not solve the cone sham equations. So he, here is using our new map and you see it introduces errors that are a lot smaller than those of the PBE exchange correlation. So th but that's easy, it's just H2, it's, you know, we get data by looking at a bunch of H2s at different distances, so it's not exactly earth shattering. Uh, then we do H2O when we get a potential energy surface and we randomly sample points and we, we get, get it working there too. Uh, but the best one we did was, we, so this getting potential energy surfaces was not good enough for the referees. Uh, and we said, you could you do MD with this? And they said, okay, so do MD with this. Uh, and in the end we did, so with Mark Tuckerman and Leslie Vogt, uh, we figured out how to, so, so you run the molecular dynamics, uh, actually I think we just use classical force fields for a molecule, and you watch it vibrate, and we run it at say 500 Kelvin in order to get a machine learned functional for 300 Kelvin, because you want to make it sort of do things, uh, explore the potential energy surface. So we do that, we sample the points, we, we take those sample points, do the cone sham calculation for the energies on that, train the machine on those cone sham calculations, and then we have machine learned energies. And then we ran the molecular dynamics with the machine learned functional. It's not production level molecular dynamics, we did numerical differences to get the forces and things, uh, but we did it. And the best one of all was this uh, malonaldehyde uh, little molecule here, and I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, uh, well, first, uh, this is the accuracy of the densities. So this picture up here is a difference between a PBE and an LDA density, and their densities are very close to each other. And then the next one here is, the diff down here is the difference between the machine learned and the PBE density, and it's much, much smaller. So, so the densities that we get in this bypassing procedure are perfectly accurate. And here's, that's Leslie and Mark, and uh, here's my this is my first ever movie, my directorial debut. Uh, and what's neat about this malonaldehyde when we ran it, uh, this is the proton switching from one side to the other. Now, this is not going to impress anyone who, uh, who knows a lot of molecular dynamics, but the great thing about it was that this was not in our training set. So our training set didn't have any proton transfers, but we run the thing and we can watch a proton transfer. And you can see that the accuracy of the machine learned functional is less uh, at the point where the proton transfers. And in fact, you really have to put in 
quantum zero point effects if you really want to do that accurately. Uh, but, but the point is, of course, we could always train uh, on more data if we wanted more accuracy there. Um, okay, so that appeared, that's an old slide, it appeared a few months ago. Okay, so, so, now, so now we have this much better way of getting uh, the density by learning it directly as a function of the potential. Uh, okay, uh, so the second recent thing is the exact functional. So, so this is where we want to do the full quantum problem, uh, uh, but we, we did it only in 1D uh, because we needed data and the, perhaps the most efficient solver in the world is DMRG, for, uh, the Density Matrix Renormalization Group is a way of solving uh, 1D quantum problems. Uh, so, so we had been setting this up for other purposes, but we decided to try it out. We just, tr since we would have the data, and um, we could generate it without too much cost, uh, we, we would try to learn the full F, which includes the exchange correlation. Uh, and so, so the things we wanted out of this was not having to solve the cone sham equations, getting strong correlation effects, because we could train on the exchange, with the exchange correlation energy as we stretch bonds, and also go to the thermodynamic limit. So here's H2, this is one dimensional H2. Uh, and we see, uh, so, so this is in one dimensional, and this is an LDA calculation, and this is the exact calculation, the exact curve, and that's pretty much the restricted calculation. Uh, now, so there's two curves here. The green here is, uh, well, the green dashed line here is using five data points, and you can sort of see where the data points were to create the machine learned functional. Uh, and, and the dashed line is evaluated on the exact density. Now, when we were doing this work, we were still doing the projection. Well, we do the functional derivative via the projection and try to get the density self consistently, and you get this really jagged green curve, which is really hopeless. Uh, but on the other hand, that red line is the same as the green one, but with 20 data points. And with the red line, you can't see the difference, and the forces are all okay and everything. Uh, so with 20 points, but again, it's just H2, right? Uh, and these are the densities, and you see they're very accurate. Uh, but then, uh, uh, so, so, so then, yes, yeah, so this problem was, uh, uh, so when we went to try to do this with longer and longer chains, we discovered again that uh, the cost got too much, uh, but Lee found a different way of solving this problem uh, using PCA. So he demonstrated, P I was at a meeting and I wanted to demonstrate PCA, so uh, I sat in my hotel room and made uh, 16 pictures of my face on my Mac, right? So principal component analysis, so you take each one of these pictures, and actually we did it in black and white uh, to make it run a little faster. And you think each one has how, who knows how many pixels of data in it, right? Uh, but this is the average of the 16, this is my mean face, right? Uh, uh, so that's the average over the whole thing. But this, so, so we do exactly the same trick, principal component analysis, find the direction in which you get the most change in the data uh, and figure out what the direction is and then add in that fraction, you know, projected along that direction. So with just one principal component, hey, you know, you'd almost recognize me, right? Uh, and then we add in a few more, five, six, uh, seven, eight. Uh, and that's one of the pictures, right, reconstructed from just eight. So seven independent, uh, seven coefficients were all that was necessary to reconstruct that picture. Now, an interesting feature here is if we look back at the original picture, I, I was grimacing in that picture, right? So you can't really tell people's emotions from uh, principal component analysis. Okay, uh, so he did that to the densities of these chains of hydrogen atoms. Uh, he did a Hirschfeld analysis, pulled out atomic uh, densities, and then, you know, so you'd have like hundreds and hundreds of these atomic densities for each. This is the chain of eight uh, at different separations, did the Hirschfeld analysis, did the principal components, and lo and behold, suddenly we had this great basis, and, and the calculations would go in a few minutes. And when we do that, uh, these are these learning curves again on the right, they're much steeper. 
doesn't make any difference for H2, but as the chain length grows, uh, you learn with much, much less data uh, using this, this uh, basis. Uh, and so, so what we were able to do was then actually extrapolate to infinity and get the infinite, this is at, a, at an equilibrium separation, but we can get the infinite chain limits of, of the energies to within one kilocalorie per mole. Uh, so this showed that you can do this if you have the data, uh, at, least in, at least in one dimension. Okay, so uh, in principle this can be done in 3D, but of course there are a lot more complications too. Uh, so these are these papers. Oh, and here are the, the most recent references for those ones. Uh, so, uh, so is this an abomination or a breakthrough, right? Some people like this machine learning stuff. Uh, some people think it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, part of my brain thinks it's really, but the physics part of my brain tends to think that this is horrible. Uh, you know, uh, you're sort of handing over, over all your intuition to the machine. On the other hand, right, the chemistry part of my brain says, well, if this stuff is useful, uh, let's try it out, right? And I keep doing it, right? Uh, so there's all sorts of things that are totally different about the density functionals that this thing creates. Uh, and one of them in particular that's very big in density functional land is exact conditions. We imagine that using exact conditions uh, help us make non-empirical functionals, right? So, so people, you know, like myself, criticize people like Don Truler for using 43 parameters in one of his exchange correlation functionals. That first one I showed you, the particle in the box problem, we had 500,000 parameters. Uh, because it was all the, all the sort of data in the grid points of the density, right? Uh, so so one, one question that's come up since we started doing this is, can you use exact conditions like we use them in regular density functional theory to improve the functionals? So this is the last paper I'll mention, uh, is the one that appeared about a week ago, uh, in which we tested this idea. So there's an exact condition that tells you that the kinetic energy functional, if you coordinate scale the density, should scale quadratically. There is another simple one for exchange. It should scale linearly with coordinate scaling. But since we, had, we knew how to play games with the kinetic energy functional. So we took two different systems. One is called a Hooke's atom, uh, where you have two electrons in a parabola. Uh, and then the other one was H2. And Actually, we did this in one dimension, but it's not going to make any difference. So when we did the Hooke's atom, here are the learning curves. And uh, so, actually, uh, this, this, I just noticed this is the wrong way around. Uh, when we do these uh, unscaled uh, calculation, the red line here. Uh, so unscaled means where we just learn without any reference to this exact condition. We get this red line. And when we uh, do, when we incorporate, so we figured out a way to incorporate the scaling condition so that it, it, uh, by construction our machine learned function would automatically satisfy this. And when we, do, when we do that we see we get almost two orders of magnitude improvement. And this is great, uh, it means we put in an exact condition and the machine learning works much better. But then when we did H2, uh, we get two curves that are almost identical. Uh, so incorporating the exact condition doesn't matter much at all. Uh, and then we spent some time trying to figure out why. And the reason why is when you scale the densities, uh, so, so to incorporate the exact condition, you take any density, you scale it, you learn the functional on the scaled version, and then you scale back again. Uh, and when you do that with the Hooke's atom in the parabola, what happens is it's like uh, two electron ions. The density doesn't change much when you scale it. So as, as you change the force constant in the parabola, in the unscaled version, it changes a lot. But if you rescale it, then there's very little change, and you get this great improvement. When you do the same thing for H2, as you stretch the bond, uh, in fact, you can show that the scale density keeps on changing uh, with the stretching of the bond. And so the scale densities differ among themselves just as much as the original densities do. And so you don't get any improvement in, in the machine learning. 
So it depends on the nature of the problem you're trying to do, right? Uh, if you think about it, so, so when we stretch an H2, if the only densities we care about are densities of an H2 molecule, they don't look much like each other as you stretch them. On the other hand, if you were doing a variety of diatomics, and you were learning from trying to get a machine learned functional that does all of them, then imposing the condition will help quite a bit, uh, because you'll have a variety of densities that look similar to each other when you scale it. Okay, uh, so let me summarize. Uh, so, so, so we can now do small molecules in, in, in three dimensions, uh, and we can do the full functional only in one dimension, but for strongly correlated solids, right? So lots of people will tell you that DFT doesn't work for strongly correlated systems, but what they really mean is that approximate functionals don't work for strongly correlated systems. In the past, we've, done, we've calculated the exact functional with the DMRG and show that it works just fine for strongly correlated systems. It's that the approximations fail. And this shows that in principle, uh, you can use machine learning to get past that restriction, right? Uh, and in fact, we have a few projects going along those lines. And these are the students uh, and various people, and also uh, Jake Hollingsworth uh, is the one who did that most recent calculation, and the collaborators. And all this started at the Institute of Pure and Applied Math at UCLA. And thank you for your attention.